Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to AFI Docs 2020, presented by AT&T, and to this Q&A for the film Stockton On My Mind, directed by Mark Levin. First, I want to thank our supporters of the festival, our presenting sponsor, AT&T, our AFI members, and you, our audience. And of course, I want to thank our guests, filmmaker Mark Levin, Mayor Michael Tubbs, and our moderator, Soraya Nadia McDonald, for joining us for this important conversation. We're proud and grateful to be presenting the virtual world premiere of Stockton On My Mind at this year's AFI Docs. The film was previously scheduled to have its world premiere at this year's Tribeca Film Festival. And please note that the film will be coming this summer to HBO. As we are recording this Q&A on Friday, June 5th, during a moment of protest and reflection throughout this country, I want to acknowledge that having this discussion today may be somewhat difficult, but it also represents an important opportunity for dialogue and for the sharing of ideas about how we as a society can acknowledge past wrongs and strive through our actions to make things better. Two ideas that I think are at the heart of the film Stockton On My Mind. I appreciate our guests for being with us today and sharing their perspectives and insights. And now I'll introduce our moderator, who will then introduce our other two guests. Soraya Nadia McDonald is the culture critic for The Undefeated. She writes about pop culture, fashion, the arts, and literature. She's the 2020 winner of the George Jean Nathan Prize for Dramatic Criticism, a 2020 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism, and the runner-up for the 2019 Vernon Jarrett Medal for Outstanding Reporting on Black Life. Thank you, Soraya. Please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so honored to be here and to be speaking uh, with Mark and with Mayor Tubbs. Um, a little bit about both of them. Uh, first up, Mayor Michael D. Tubbs uh, was elected on November 8th, 2016 to serve as the mayor of the city of Stockton, California. Upon taking office in January 2017, uh, Mayor Tubbs became Stockton's youngest mayor and the city's first African-American mayor. Uh, Michael Tubbs is also the youngest mayor in the history of the country, representing a city with a population of over 100,000 residents. Um, he was included in Fortune's 2018 Top 40 Under 40, Forbes's 2018 list, Forbes's 2018 list of the 30 Under 30, and the Roots 100. Before becoming mayor, uh, Mayor Michael Tubbs served as Stockton's District 6 City Council member. Uh, he was elected at age 22 in 2013, becoming one of the youngest council members in, this, uh, in the country. Um, Mark Levin is an award-winning filmmaker dedicated to telling powerful, real stories in a unique, authentic style. His honors include Sundance's Grand Jury Prize, four Emmys, four DuPont Columbia Awards, most recently, he directed I Promise, which followed the students of LeBron James's I Promise School during its inaugural year. Uh, Mark is also the director of Brick City, a groundbreaking docu-series about the city of New York, New Jersey, and its charismatic mayor, Cory Booker, now a sitting U.S. Senator. Uh, to Mark and to Mayor Tubbs, thank you so much for being here. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, so, you know, let's just jump right in. Um, and actually, before we do that, uh, because this is June 5th, um, I just want to acknowledge that today would have been Breonna Taylor's 27th birthday, um, had she still been alive um, and not a victim um, of police violence. Uh, and I, I just want to recognize the, you know, enormous um, absence um, that, that we're dealing with right now because of her, because of the death of George Floyd and, and so many others. Um, Mayor Tubbs, can you tell me a little bit about being a mayor um, at this point right now um, with everything that's going on with the country? You know, initially I was just like, geez, this has to be an enormous challenge just for someone 
dealing with coronavirus um, and all of the sort of attendant issues that have come up with that. Um, but now, you know, we are also seeing a country that is really rising up in defiance um, of police violence and violence directed particularly uh, at Black people. Um, so what does that look like in terms of like what your work um, is on a daily basis right now? Yeah, um, it's, well, first of all, thank you for, for centering us on, on those remarks um, and on the lives lost and the incredible work we have to do as a country um, to be a real democracy with real liberty and justice for everyone. Um, I, I would say it's, it's, it's very tough. Um, years old, I'm black, I'm a man, um, and I have a lot in common with many of the people protesting and many of the people who have been victims of, of police violence, not just this month, but over the past 400 years in this country. And at the same time, I'm the mayor who, um, the re the, who works with the police department, works with the police chief, has, has, helps set policy and has to message to people who may not even agree at this point that Black Lives Matter. Um, so it, it, it's really about just holding space. And, and explaining to folks, being a translator of sorts and explaining to folks sort of what, what's at the root of the rage, but also explaining to folks who are justifiably angry how what you're seeing nationally may not be a story in Stockton today because of the work we've done over the past three years with basic income, with um, gun violence strategies that since wrong, providing opportunity versus jail time, um, with our scholarship program, just with how like this idea like, is police violence, but structural violence has been at the root of how we try to govern and how we know everything's not perfect and we're not going to reverse 400 years and four, but you have a mayor who understands deeply, viscerally, and personally on what's at stake and also explains to the community that, no, we have to do this work and we can be a model because it's good for everyone when Black Lives Matter. It's good for everyone when folks don't feel, and, and also just really talk about the role of police. Like, do we want police to be social workers and mental health clinician and jobs and and, and everything? At, because that seems to be our response to every social ill is, is cops. And for the past four years, myself and the police chief have been very clear that we don't want all of our money to go to the police department. We don't want our response to our, our the neighborhoods I grew up in. Some of our neighborhoods that are high with have high crime rates, but also have, of opportunity and how we're really focused on increasing investments in those areas. So it's been a it's been a challenge, and on top of that, COVID nineteen. So to answer your question directly, um, my my days are spent in a mix of interviews, in a, in a mix of Zoom calls, um, talking with my city manager, talking with my police chief, talking to the community, talking to the press, um, organizing mutual aid things, making sure folks have their basics met, um, talking with the governor talking with the speaker, like just talking with everyone to make sure Stockton has what it needs and that we also take advantage of this moment to actually do the hard work necessary to get to the root cause of a lot of rage and nihilism people are feeling. And Mark, I want to bring you in here um, because you obviously have quite a bit of experience, um, first with following um, Senator Booker, um, but also in the documentary that you made um, about I promise um, with looking at and observing you know situations that on their face um, you know there's an enormous amount of adversity um, you know particularly you know in cities when we're thinking about Newark or when we're thinking about Stockton you know as you say at the beginning of the film um, that there's this there's this nor notoriety um, that is attached to these places. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like what you observed, um, you know, watching Mayor Tubbs do his job um, and particularly, you know, what stands out to you, you know, having the context of someone, um, you know, who documented the work uh, that Senator Booker was doing, uh, you know, when he was, when he was in Newark. Um, well, thank you. Uh for that question. I, I guess I would say two things, just to start off um, on what the mayor just said. Um, in Stockton um, and in Newark, uh, we haven't seen uh, violent, you know, um, looting and disturbances. There's been some minor incidents, but we haven't seen uh, the, the kind of uh, vandalism uh, on the scale that we've seen in other cities. 
And I think that is a testament uh, to Mayor Tubbs, uh, to Mayor Cory Booker when he was mayor, and to Ross Baraka, uh, who is the mayor now and who many thought uh, as, as somewhat uh, had been characterized as a black militant, as a black nationalist, uh, black power, uh, that you know he was going to lead Newark into chaos. And instead, uh, I don't know if you've seen the video, but there was actually a protest where they were all dancing uh, in the street uh, in downtown Newark. So uh, I think what's, what, what's attracted me to, to Michael, I mean, I actually met Michael when he was a, a, a city councilman. Uh, and was impressed, uh, and he did relate to me the story that uh, Oprah Winfrey had uh, contributed to his uh, first campaign, and that she had only contributed to two other politicians, uh, those two being Cory Booker and Barack Obama. So I was like, oh, well, wow, you're in good company there, Michael. And uh, I said, I better, I better watch where this young man is headed. But what had attracted me to Stockton at that point was, of course, uh, the economic collapse, was the ground zero for the subprime mortgage uh, crisis and the Great Recession that followed, and then it went bankrupt. Um, so uh, on uh, in November of 2016, when Michael was um, elected the youngest mayor, as you said, of a major U.S. city, and Donald Trump was elected, the divergence in views was so great. And I've been attracted to trying to see on a local level where you can really see how politicians, policymakers interact with real people, real problems, is less ideological posturing, there's less gridlock. You've got to get the, the snow plowed, the potholes filled, the schools open. Um, and I think with Michael, what, what um, impressed me so much was uh, two things. One, how thoughtful uh, and, and that he was, uh, had, had, had intellectual depth that was searching for uh, new answers that weren't necessarily left or right, but that, that were like, how, how do we move forward and how do we break the cycle of poverty and violence and inequality? All these issues, which are, as you've said, so systematically rooted. Um, and the other was that he had a personal story uh, that was pretty unique. Uh, I mean, Cory Booker had, had, had grown up in suburban Jersey uh, and, you know, gone to Stanford. But Michael, who went to Stanford, had grown up in the hood, born of a teenage mom, his dad in prison for most of his life. And that connection between the personal and the policy and political was fascinating. And I wondered, could you weave them together? Now, I'll be honest, uh, Michael was uh, a little hesitant on, on the personal side, you know, in terms of his, his father and, and certainly understand that and respect that. Uh, but I felt I needed, without his assistance or involvement, you know, to kind of see if that could be part of the story. So those were two things, and, and I truly am thankful and uh, appreciate that, that Michael respected me enough that, that he allowed us to at least pursue that. You know, I think that's that's part of what makes uh, this documentary stand out and what makes it compelling, Mayor Tubbs, um, is that, you know, we have someone who in one generation uh, has accomplished so much. Um, and what I'm interested in, in learning from you is um, how your relationships with your family, with your mother, with your father, with your grandmother, um, have had an effect on the way you relate to the people of Stockton, um, the way you relate to incarcerated people, um, you know, and how uh, you hope other folks can see, you know, all sorts of people. Yeah, I think just um, the, the personal is the only reason why I'm involved in politics. I would absolutely um, love to do something else, but just every policy decision, every policy matter is so personal for me. I decided to run for city council, in fact, after one of my cousins was murdered in, in Stockton. So the whole frame is about sort of how do we use government to not do everything, but to at, least, at the very least rectify the harms it has caused. Um, so... I think from my mom and, and, and my grandmother, they really, I didn't know there was a term until I went to college for feminism or, or feminist. I didn't know there was a term. I didn't know, I thought everyone just thought women were amazing and should run things. Cause that was just my life. Like my mom, my grandma, my aunt, very strong, very clear, very direct. And they were the bosses. 
and, and, and I'm just used to seeing women in leadership. That was just like my national, that was my, my, my go-to, my, 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 my frame. So it was interesting when I got, and I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is unique. And this, this is not something that's a, a common experience. But I think now, as a policymaker, it causes me to think very clearly about like, okay, essential workers, who's providing childcare? Because I know a lot of our mothers in Stockton are single. Um, for Mother's Day, we gave, every, we gave 125 single mothers $500 gift cards. Um, to spend all, the, all they wanted because I realized that just thinking about my mom and how she struggled in work, how that would have been a lot, particularly in a pandemic with a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, I think my grandmother has been really helpful with kind of spiritual grounding and in, in understanding that, 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 that there is in, in our faith tradition of God, who's a God of justice, who believes very deeply in, in, in that the role of any righteous person is to care about the poor um, and to, to defend everyone, but particularly defend the widow, the orphan, and the oppressed. I think that kind of clarity of, of mission and frame just allows me to kind of focus on with finite resources and competing priorities, which ones are the most important in terms of what it means to be a good and moral and, and, and just city. Um, and I would also say from my father, I think that journey has been very, very, very instructive for me. Um, growing up, I was a kid who believed in agency, who believed if I did everything right and 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 worked really hard and did everything perfectly and worked twice as hard, three times as hard. That I would be successful. And if I was successful, that meant everyone else could do it too if they just worked hard enough. That idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And I mean, that's partly true. I mean, I, I was able to, to be quote unquote successful, but as I got older, I realized there's a bunch of structural forces and that no one should have to work three, four times harder than someone else to get to the same spot. Like that's just not functional. That's actually, that's actually a dysfunction. And also just understanding and, 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 and thinking and reflect on my dad's story how the, the term prisoner or convict or criminal is so limiting and so reductionistic that it robs people of humanity and it robs of context and it robs of redemption. Um, so I think a lot of the work I do now with reentry, with, with second chances, with um, job opportunities, with violence re prevention and reduction is really rooted off sort of preventing um, young people from, from growing up in communities that make choices like the ones my father made seem rational but also just understanding that we're more, as Brian Stevenson said, than the worst thing that we've done. And that there's so much potential, so much skill, so many assets that are locked away um, in these cages. Um, so, and I think because I don't have the strongest relationship um, with, with my father, I think I, I work incredibly hard um, for everyone who, who, who's coming out um, from incarceration or to prevent people from coming in as my way of, 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 of not, not giving back, but just, because. I think it'd be really easy to be in my position and to tell a really easy story. Like, no, you guys need to work hard. You guys need to study that you guys can go to Stanford and you don't have anyone to blame for yourself. Um, but I think that, that you should also, you should definitely work hard. You should definitely exercise agency, but we have to talk about structure. And, and I think I, I annoy some people um, because I, I choose to tell the story of structure. I, I choose to focus on sort of how the policy choices we're making, creating the, the, choices that individuals make and I choose to tell very nuanced stories of what it means to be poor or what it means to be black or what it means to be incarcerated or what it means to to, to grow up in a, in, a, in a community like Stockton and all of its pain but of all of its power and, and glory as well. So I really want to ask both of you about this. Uh, Mark of course is a person who's basically sort of observing uh, what's happening, and and you, Mayor Tubbs, is this person who's basically, you know, taken the leadership role in, in implementing um, this experiment with universal basic income, um, particularly when we're talking about um, structural inequalities. Um, you know, there there seems to be a lot of anxiety when it comes to saying we trust that people know what to do with the money that we give them. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a direct contrast from a different kind of paternalism that usually comes with any kind of uh, assistance. And I realized that the results of the UBI study um, won't necessarily be completed until 2021. Um, but is there anything that you can share with us about what you've already um, observed with the implementation uh, of the study? Yeah, and, and thank you for that question. I think the biggest thing I've learned actually is the point you raised. 
that in our country, we, 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 we trust some people with money because we gave $2 trillion in tax cuts to business owners and millionaires and no one has I've received more questions about how people spend $1 million in philanthropic funding than has been asked the people who spent $2 trillion of our money, <laughs> of, our, of our dollars. And I think it just goes to the, 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 and part of the reason for the rage we were seeing in these uprisings is that we just have a different set of rules for different people. We also have different expectations. So for some reason we trust millionaires, we trust big corporations with money. And we think that if we give them money, our society will actually be better off, that the benefits will spread through trickling down. But when we give folks like regular people, working class people, but particularly people of color, it's given all the tropes and schemas we have, then it becomes like, how are they gonna spend this money? Or, or they're poor because they don't know how to manage money. So I think the biggest contribution of this pilot is to show that no, government, like you can't do everything. That in some cases, the best thing you can do is level, is create opportunity and let people have exercise agency to make choices. Understanding that not everyone is going to make the choices you would make, but by and large, the vast majority of people are, are, are rational actors and, and will make good decisions. And I say that because what we found in the study is that for everyone, month by month, because incomes are so volatile, there's different decisions that have to be made with the $500 that no government leader or bureaucrat is smart enough to think for 315,000 people. So for example, I first came in thinking we should do housing vouchers. Like, well, housing's the issue. Rent's too high. Let's give everyone a housing voucher. But we have a housing voucher program. And a lot of people on Section 8 are still struggling because that's not the only bill they have. They have car notes. They have health care bills. They have credit card bills. They have grocery bills. So what we've seen in, in the study is that thus far, month to month to month, people are spending the money on how like you and I would spend the money. So food, utilities, um, bills, helping out neighbors, getting better jobs because they're able to take time off their retail job and interview. And we're actually able to extend the pilot for six more months because of COVID-19 to through the end of the year. And every month have like a spending update on, at StocktonDemonstration.org. And what we're seeing during COVID-19 that people are spending the money on food. Like 48% of all the spending is on food because people are sheltering in place. Their kids are coming home and they just have to make sure. That, so they're not spending money on yachts or um, offshore accounts or crazy vacations or ice sculptures. They're literally spending the money in ways that help their families, but also help the small businesses around them. So it, it yeah. <laughs> Mark, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I think Michael summed uh, that uh, part of the story up pretty well. I mean, I would just say, obviously, the basic income, the universal basic income idea is part of what attracted myself, HBO, uh, to do this film in Stockton. We had uh, done a series of films for HBO, uh, starting with Schmata, Rags to Riches to Rags, Hard Times Lost on Long Island, Class Divide, that looked at the impact of these major economic forces in transforming everyday people's lives. So when somebody said, oh, we're going to be the first city or the first mayor to sponsor a basic income experiment, uh, you know, our radar went up and said, wow, we need to check this out. I would just add that what is also unique about what Michael's doing and what's happening in Stockton is it's a holistic approach. Uh, in other words, it's, it's basic income is part of giving young people more educational opportunities as part of innovative approaches to criminal justice, to gun reduction and gun violence. All of these things go together. And I guess uh, Michael's mantra, which he introduces at the beginning of the film, upset the setup, you know, that he upset the setup. He was set up for a potential of uh, going to jail like his father or, or even being dead as his cousin tragically ended up. Uh, and he beat the odds. How do you set up a system that more people can beat the odds? And I guess the, the final thing I would add is just that um, I think there is a hunger now with this uprising, with the COVID-19, that yes, we have this opportunity for a paradigm shift, for a new social contract. We're not going back to normal. We're not going back to the way it used to be. There's gotta be something else that comes out of this crisis. Uh, and this economic crisis that we're in also. And I think the seeds of that are really in communities like Stockton, where you see these experiments on a local level. And it's, and it's Michael, but it might, there, there's a network of change agents, you know, that are all operating, you know, uh, in this kind of ecology of change. 
Uh, and that uh, I've come to believe that's where the real change is going to happen. It's going to be grassroots. We can't look to Washington. We can't look to the White House, which now, you know, they're building a wall around the White House, you know, walling it off from the American people. It's on this local level. It's on this grassroots level. Um, and it's all of these uh, factors of breaking this cycle, breaking the cycle of, of violence and of poverty, uh, of an inequality. Uh, that has to happen on a community level. And uh, that I think is happening in Stockton. Doesn't mean that there aren't problems, doesn't mean that he doesn't run in the opposition. But I think the basic income element fits into this larger mosaic. Um, I definitely want to talk a little bit about uh, upsetting the setup. Um, and, and this question is also for both of you. You know, one of the things that I have observed, um, you know, over this past few weeks, um, as, as there's been so much unrest in the country and, and people have been rightfully disturbed, um, is that, you know, white people are asking, what can they do, right? Um, how can, white people, especially those who are, who are new to sort of thinking about these structural inequalities, um, you know, that have long been in existence, um, how can they be effective co-conspirators in upsetting the setup? Yeah, I, I mean, that's such a great question. It's an, it's an important question. I was telling one of my white friends the other day that if it was up to black people to end racism, it would have been ended 400 years ago. We've always been protesting. We've always been upset. We've always been uprising. We've always been saying, this is not right. Look at the 89% of black men who voted for against Donald Trump, 93% of black. Like, we're very clear as to sort of how do you make America American um, and live up to, to our values. So I think for my white friends and, and, and white brothers and sisters everywhere, I think part of it is having that conversation with white people. Um, I, I think that again, um, it's and be making it about human rights, right? Like the fact that black people are people too and they're human too and should they be afforded the same rights and protections and privileges that, that you all get. But I think it's having those tough conversations, not on Twitter, and not texting your black friend and checking on them, but check in with your mothers, your aunties, your dads, your uncles, your cousins, um, people who may have supported President Trump, um, people who may not support President Trump, but harbor prejudices and biases and really talk to them about that because we know we live in a society and it's not just the police, it's, it's our school system, it's our healthcare system, it's almost, it's literally every system, it's the media, where we're inundated with these messages that, that, that kind of lead to beliefs and behaviors consistent with white supremacist thoughts and actions, um, meaning that we have to actively unlearn. So I think a big part of it is doing what I had to do is reading books and really kind of understanding and learning sort of what's right, what's wrong, how, and how do we fix it. But I think the first and most important thing is to talk to other white people about sort of racism and, and the importance of 2020 and the importance of um, watching what you type on next door and the important and, 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 th and, th and things like that while also educating. And then if you are talking or wanting to reach out to like black friends and others, reach out to listen and learn in terms of, okay, like what can I do? Help me understand the experience. And the last thing I would say, and I've been saying this a lot locally, is that it's just about having like basic empathy because no one in my family, uh, at least in the last 200 years, have been immigrants. Yeah, when I see kids in cages, it bothers me. When, when I have kids scared because they see ICE agents in the neighborhood, I'm upset and I protest, I speak out about that. When I see um, white people in Appalachia with no internet and, 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 and substandard housing, I'm upset, it, 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 it's visceral for me when, when Trump enacted his ban against Muslims. My family's been Christian for the last 300 years, but when he enacted that Muslim ban, I was upset, I was angry. So again, I think it's about just basic human empathy and, 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 just, and, and just really feeling the, the, the love for all people, including black people. I think you're right. You know, you start with uh, listen, learn, act. Um, but I think the uh, two things happening, you know, I see in my family, one, a, a, a vigorous, passionate debate on just um, 
where we stand, both in our moral values and in how we feel, you know, what's the right thing to move forward. I mean, some in my family are, 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 are more radical than me um, and have been arrested in these demonstrations and, and actually don't even believe in reform, you know, are, are, uh, and then there are others who, uh, my brother-in-law is a cop. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, are, are trying to defend the police in, in the midst of this. Uh, I think that the bottom line is, is, Michael, what you were referring to, is seeing the other. In other words, un, th this whole white backlash of, you know, that started, uh, you know, really in, in Nixon's era, but, you know, that the welfare cheats and are, are, are taking our money and it's our tax money and the immigrants are taking it and the, the, our jobs are being taken and our good schools are being taken. It's, it's this idea of the other taking and it's, it's a very primitive and yet uh, basic instinct the fear of the other versus seeing diversity. And, and I think we should mention, Michael, that, that your city, Stockton, has been called by U.S. News and World Report the most diverse city in the United States. Seeing diversity, the, the, the motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, that diversity is a strength. We are stronger together. Uh, that's a biological fact, even in resisting a virus, that diversity strengthens you. Uh, and that it is not a fear of the other, that, that the bad schools, like you mentioned, I promise, you know, and people saying, oh, well, why should I pay for, you know, taxes, you know, for poor black kids in, in the inner city? You know, I don't live there. Why should I pay? To not understand that we're all connected and we're all interconnected. And then one way or another, we pay. We pay for these injustices. We pay for this inequality. Uh, and that, you know, having those dialogues across uh, the spectrum, I think, is a starting place, at least for me. And if I just add one thing, what was fascinating, Mark, about what you said and caused me to remember, like, in the New York Times, there was literally an article two months ago that talked about how racism is literally a national security risk, that literally our foreign adversaries see racism and racial inequality and white supremacy as a weakness to exploit, to, to diminish America's standing in the world and to weaken our defenses. So, so I think even if you don't care about anything else in terms of your own standing as, as an American national, this pervasive racism is being actively exploited and the FBI and CIA have said, this is a national security issue that our, our country is, is less safe domestically and internationally because we just allow racism to run rampant and unchecked. I'm so grateful to you two for the, the work that you have done um, and the time and the energy that you have dedicated um, to trying to interrogate um, and solve really serious and entrenched issues. Um, but I also know that there is, there is more to us, there is more to life than just that. And so, you know, the last question that I have for both of you is, um, how and where are you seeking and finding joy right now? Well, I can answer that pretty easily. Uh, family and friends, I have to admit that this pause uh, has given me the opportunity. I, I can get lost easily in the, uh, the, the, the bubble of work and, uh, and, and, and these projects. And it was great to shuttle from the uh, third and fourth graders in Akron uh, at the I Promise School to the uh, seniors at Edison High School. I mean, it, it was inspiring in and, and, and the last two years. But uh, I realized, you know, time with family and friends uh, to just sit down and talk like we're talking over a dinner table. Um, this has given me uh, that pause and luckily uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to, you know, make it. Uh, so that's that's been, uh, for me, the joy. And uh, two of my children, my two children, uh, are both expecting children. And so for me, uh, Michael just had his son, and that, as you know, is part of the film. Uh, but I guess in some silent way, I've been waiting to take that step. I never thought I would, but to be a grandparent, to be a grandfather. And now I'm getting time to spend with uh, my daughter, who's pregnant with twins, uh, and my son and his wife, who's pregnant with a son. And these will be our first uh, grandchildren. So we're going to get three grandchildren within a matter of months. So that's a great joy. Yeah, I think for me, um, 
my wife, um, who's in the film, Anna, um, my seven-month-old now son, uh, Michael Malachi. Um, it's just been great just to be home every single day, at dinner every single day. My son knows when he wakes up at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. In, in the morning every single day, I'm there to hold him. We wrestle, we play, and it's just, it's just, it, it, it's good to have that sort of routine and that, and that level of normalcy and just being really focused on what matters. And because I think you get caught up in doing so much of the work and giving so much of yourself that you forget the why. And a big part of the why is sort of the people we love, like our, our, our community for sure, but our, our, our families, our, our, our partners, our children, et cetera. I mean, the second thing is I've really had a chance to kind of, I mean, things are still crazy being busy, but at least every day or every other day, I get to go out in nature and walk and jog. And that sounds very basic, but I had never been able to do that, either because of where I lived growing up or because of just being so busy on city council since I was 21 years old. It's the first time I get to like take time and walk and look at the trees and, 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 and jog. And that has, I mean, I still hate jogging, but it gives me great joy that I, I'm actually doing it. And it's something I can talk about with my friends who are on the Nike Plus app. <laughs> well, Mark Levin and Mayor Michael Tubbs of Stockton, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Godspeed and good luck in your, in your further endeavors. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Mark, for making such a great film. Thank you, Mayor, for entrusting us to do it.